This podcast is brought to you by Aspers Casino Newcastle, home of the £4 pint on match day. That's all Newcastle home games and any televised Newcastle fixture. The offer applies from midday until midnight on all draft beers. Be gamble aware, over 18s only. Visit begambleaware.org. Uh, be drink aware and for details and T's and C's, visit aspersnewcastle.co.uk. It's a True Faith podcast with me, Cy Campbell, and special guest Craig Hope, who normally joins us on our Patreon platform, but as we have a game-free week, he's joined us for the for the free show. Craig, lots to talk about. We'll get straight into it. Um, actually, the last few times we've spoken, Newcastle have been on in a bit of rocky form, so uh, for once we get to talk to you after a kind of upsurge. Mm. Things looking a bit different. Newcastle are on, on the rise. European football's back on the cards. Have we turned a corner? Question <laughs> one. Do you know what? We've spoken about corners turned before and they've ended up being blind alleys. The, the biggest one of all being post Aston Villa. You know, we were down there that night and everything about that performance screamed last season. What then followed? You know, it didn't mm. it didn't really transpire. I'm more confident and more prepared to commit to a, a corner being turned this time. And the reason I say that is because there's there's a bigger body of evidence now. There's four games yep. on the spin post uh, post the Dubai break, whereby Newcastle have looked more like the the team of old. I say the team of old. It, it's almost in many ways. I've just punched the microphone there. Uh, <laughs> it's almost going back to not the team of last season, but the team of the season before, especially yeah. the game on yeah. Saturday. In that Eddie has always wanted to evolve. He looked at what they did from uh, from January to May onwards in his first season. And yes, while it was successful, while it worked, he always saw it as a means to an end. He wanted to evolve, and that was why we saw the likes of Sandro Tonali come in into a possession-based team whose uh, you know, their, their, their fate was in their own hands more. They dictated games, the possession counter was weighted in their favour. That's what he wanted to go towards. What we saw on Saturday and what we saw to a degree at times at Fulham, I think, even though I wasn't there for that one, was more the relegation season, a pragmatism. And I've been saying this for weeks, Si. I think the last time I sat in this chair, I said Newcastle should do what works in the isolation and the tools of what they've got for this season, taking into, into consideration the absences and the injuries. Well, on Saturday, we saw that. You know, I think we saw that. I forget what was the other game. Was was it the Wolves game as well, where they sat deep and just played yep. and sprung on the break and they used the energy and the legs of Willick. And, and then for whatever reason, they went away from that for a couple of games and you thought, no, just go back to go back to what works. On Saturday, wow, what a victory it was for Eddie Howe. Have you ever seen a team have 27% possession, yet be so much in control of a game. It really was quite startling. He did a number on Ange Postacoglu. I thought it was a brilliant victory, a brilliant management performance allied by what the guys on the field did. And the reason I say I'm prepared to commit to them too in the corners, because this is four games on the spin now. It's 10 points from 12. They would have won at home to Everton if they'd had more options mm. from the bench. And I always thought on Saturday, because the bench was similar actually in terms of probably even weaker, they had nothing from the bench on Saturday, given the two who could have come on Hall and Livermento weren't actually weren't actually fit they were always going to have to devise a game plan whereby they won the game in the first yeah. hour they did better than that they won the game inside 51 minutes so so no I think the last four in I've always said I've another Eddie Howe for me is the best Monday to Friday manager in the you know in Europe if not the world and now he's had longer to work during that period with this group of players you know, in any group of players, any 11, the 11 on Saturday had six Steve Bruce players in it, for goodness sake. I just think now, I think we really are set to see them have a really strong close to the season. So in answer to your question, yes, corner turn. The corner's finally been turned. We're not, we're not looking back. Um, I suppose the interesting uh, follow-up question is, because you've kind of touched on it, is was, because the approach is there to see, it, we've changed and it is 100%, we've reverted back to kind of the more backs to the wall, we're going to catch you on the break and kind mm. of, be more productive with the ball whilst letting the other team kind of have it in their own half and spend loads of time. Um, and Spurs were terrible at it with the ball. They, mm. they, they offered nothing. They really didn't look like ever breaking us down despite the fact that we had that makeshift back four, which now has conceded one goal in three and looks actually pretty uh, yeah, yeah. pretty solid. Um, the question is, is yeah, has, has Eddie Howe been forced into that kind of change by the personnel he's left to choose from? Or is it is it more the latter thing you said, that now he's got time to kind of work on the training ground, he's seen what is and isn't working, he's had time to kind of change the original plan for the season, which, like you say, was to to use possession and kind of be mm. a bit more front foot. Um, to, to revert back, did he need time to work with the players on, right, this is what we're doing, we're going back to this? Uh, and was he unable to do that when the fixtures were so, you know, abundant? Um, is that is that what you think's happened, or is it more that, you know, we've just kind of learned this is this is the way? 
Yeah, no, I think it's the, you presented two options there. I think it's more the latter and that Eddie has realised this is the way to go forward. And I love Eddie how I, you know, I, I always go into the bathroom whenever it's put to me, is Eddie under pressure, is he not under pressure? But I do think with regards reverting to this type of system with the personnel available to him, it should have happened a little bit sooner. I really do, you know, if I, if, if I was going to make one criticism of him, like I touched on in the previous answer, I've been saying this for a long time now, mm. be more practical. Just use what what is on Newcastle's greatest assets at the moment. You know, two, two pacey forwards in terms of Isaac and, and Anthony Gordon. Anthony Gordon's been the strongest asset all season. Why not? sit deeper why not seed possession then when you do get it just give it to Gordon you know I, I think that should have been the ploy for a, for a long time now in too many games I think they they try to have too much of the ball Newcastle aren't good enough on the ball yet you know Sandro Tonali was brought in for that reason to retain possession as much as I like Sean Longstaff and Sean's had a difficult period I think he's carrying a little bit of something in mitigation uh, you know Sean isn't a player who's going to be in that midfield and mm. dictate Joe Willock hasn't played this year but even he isn't really you know Joe Willock is more a transition type of player uh, Bruno has been playing in midfield for, for a long time now on his own on his own almost and I think I think even at present Bruno is more suited to a game plan of rather than having lots of the ball and trying mm. to dictate things just getting it winning it and springing one of those passes or one of those balls through the lines as he's done absolutely brilliantly in recent games so so no and this is a might sound like a slight criticism of the manager perhaps because it is but I do think this option has been available to him for longer then it has been actually implemented. But I think now he's realised this is the way forward and isn't it good to see? I suppose to give him a little bit more credit, specifically on Saturday's performance, it was more than just the kind of the way we approached the game and the, the intensity and the, and the allowing Spurs to have the ball and, and being more, like you say, more direct um, with, with our possession. In the, the kind of dynamic way he set up the defence in midfield, that kind of three at the back mm. that kind of evolved into a five and a four, yeah. depending on where the ball was on the pitch surely the credit's all his for making that and making that work because that came out of nowhere where we've not really mm. seen that before. We've seen a couple of dabbles with kind of fluid fullbacks and wingbacks, but that's the first time we've seen a proper system that just absolutely yeah. worked and Spurs had no answer to it. Yeah. Well, there was a period sign. I said this on, on my YouTube channel repeatedly, by the way, Craig Hope underscore Daily Mail, if you do want to, uh, <laughs> if you do want to subscribe. Uh, yeah, and it, it's a pretty harsh phrase to use, but I felt there was a period in Newcastle's season where they were being sent out with the same formation, with the same system, with no sort of in-game tweaks. And I likened it to Lemmings being sent over a cliff just to go out and get beat every week. Eddie was so wedded to, to the 4-3-3, to the players within the 4-3-3, to the strategy they would adopt within that formation. Well, on Saturday, wow, how refreshing was it to see a, a different system from the off, the 3-4-3, three, three, I think we'll call it. Then, actually, in-game, it adapted to become a four at the back with J.P. Murphy slotting in. Like I say, you know, that should have, for me, should have happened probably a little bit sooner in Newcastle's season than it has done, but that doesn't negate from the praise he is due and the, the, the praise he is worth for Saturday. As I said at the top there, it was a real victory for management. And why can't Eddie Howe evolve? He's only 45, you know. Why can't he improve as a manager? Why can't he learn? He still mm. is a, a relatively young coach. He'd admit himself he's made mistakes this season. But that for Saturday against a team who were chasing Champions League football was a manager showing himself to be tactically more astute than a guy who's had a hell of a lot of positive press this season. I thought it was a... Yeah, while it was you know Newcastle, what was it in the end? Four, five, four. What was it? Four nil. Four nil. While it was Newcastle, four. <laughs> could have been uh, more. Definitely could have been more. <laughs> while it was Newcastle, four. Spurs nil. I also thought it was you know Eddie Howe a massive one, and Postecoglou nil. Yeah, I suppose the subject of Eddie Howe, which we, me and you, have talked about a lot this season. Um, again, not necessarily either of us as his critics, but he has developed some critics over the season mm. for some of the, the perceived kind of slow to change things or sticking to his guns a little bit too much. Do you think? Do you think he's kind of silenced most of those critics? Again, I'm not saying you're one of them, but mm. has he has he silenced those critics or is there more to do? Do we still have to... I mean, I think we're on course now to get back into Europe, I suppose. Mm. One of my other questions to you is, do you think we'll do that? But has he silenced those critics? Do, do they go away now because we're, we're kind of back, back well, where we should be? Right, well, Si, I want to put this back at you. Where were those critics and where did they exist? Because I did something on radio on Saturday before the game from the press box and they put a similar sort of question to me and I said, I said, Spend time inside St. James's Park. I said, take, take yourself back 20 years where the only barometers for a manager being under pressure or having critics or otherwise were to read what was being said in the press, you know, mm. specifically local guys like myself. While I work for a national newspaper, I'm, I'm based up here and I'm with Eddie two or three times a week. And to also gauge the temperature and the mood inside a stadium. If you had only looked at what myself and my Northeast colleagues had written this season, 
And if you had only experienced what had happened inside St. James's Park, even during the Rocky results, you wouldn't have said Eddie Howe was under any pressure. You wouldn't have said there was any unrest, any uprising, any notion of a managerial change. So where does that noise come from? By virtue of eliminating <laughs> two sources, you're left with one, and that is social media. Yeah, yeah. And I do think a lot of, I think social media is extreme. Uh, it always will be, shows no signs of changing. We experience this as journalists when they win, they're wonderful. When they get beat, they're terrible. And there's no real middle ground. And I've always tried to position myself, and I think I do the same with you, you know, we do when, when we have a chat and when we have a beer, and Alex as well, you know, is good at this, trying to find a trying to find a, a middle ground at times. And it, that is part, you know, you are allowed to populate middle ground. It is okay. <laughs> you don't have to have an extreme opinion. For me, a lot of the criticism of the critics of Eddie Howe came from artificial means, if you like. That doesn't mean he was above or beyond criticism. Definitely not. But what do you, what, to what I've said there, because I'm removed from the fan element of it, you're in the pubs more than me, pre-game, during the game and the concourses post-match. Was there pressure? Was there noise? Uh, I think even that's a hard one to answer because me and the people I go at the match with all have very similar views and, and I would say no, there hasn't been a huge amount of noise. Not many of the people I speak to have ever questioned the manager. They've questioned some of the players and I think there are certain players that I always stick up for, especially the local lads, uh, mm. Longstaff in particular, <laughs> who who b b bear the brunt of, of what I would call frustration rather than criticism. So mm. I think there's been a lot of um, crowds this season that have... have Perhaps I'm not going to use the word negative, but the frustration in the air, kind of short tempered and and quick to kind of get show that frustration. And, you know, you, you kind of get the grumbles and if, if a misplaced pass, yeah. we haven't seen that for under Eddie Howe so far. And it's only mm. been the season where those kind of um, murmurings have started because we've had those spells of kind of bad results, especially December. And everyone understood it. Everyone knew the, the injuries and the, the mitigations that were that were there and still are. We're still, you know, basically picking 11 players from from. 25 there's only 11 available um so yeah it, it's it's a good point that the noise and the kind of actual criticism of Eddie Howe comes from faceless social mm. media accounts generally um the, the, there has been a change in attitude a change in kind of general atmosphere I think I think people have asked at least asked questions yeah. and had more conversations about it as we have yeah, and like fair. you said that's absolutely fair and yeah, reasonable yeah. especially when the, the team isn't winning games you'll mm. talk about it and try and understand why they're not winning mm. games um but I suppose you're right that the actual threat of Eddie Howe's job hasn't really been there much. Mm. We've talked about it a bit and whether or not there should be questions asked, but I don't think there's been any serious noise mm. of that direction. But I suppose it goes on the back burner for now. We're, we're, we're on course for a really strong finish. And mm. given what we've been through the season, given that we played Champions League football, those big six fixtures, we got to the cup quarterfinal twice. Um, what... It, we, we look like we can get to Europe. One, mm. do you think we can get to Europe? And two, would you say that's a pretty good season, actually? I think it is. And uh, you know, I was asked the question the other day, if Newcastle managed to finish sixth and qualify for the Europa League in the process, is it a bigger achievement than what Eddie achieved last season? My mm. answer is absolutely not. You no. know, I think last season will forever stand alone as just one of the greatest achievements to take a team he inherited in the previous November from 19th to 4th. Nothing will ever beat that. Does that mean getting sixth in Europa League this time around with all the injuries, the mitigation, Sandro Tonali, the suspension, everything else isn't a, a, an incredible feat? Well, no, it's still very good, but it doesn't beat last season. Do I think it's achievable? Yeah, absolutely. I do. I, I think they're in a position now, and you look at the fixtures, I know there's only two of the six are at home, uh, but arguably you could say that now playing away from home with that setup, with that system, if... I called them this the other day, the notorious B.I.G., Barnes, Isaac and Gordon, <laughs> if they manage to stay fit and in form, playing on the break mm. with that three away from home could be absolutely tailor-made uh, for them, I think. So, so I think they'll finish the season strongly. Last night's results in terms of, you know, losing that extra European place and they're probably going to have to get sixth now to, to guarantee Europe. Otherwise, the danger it could be the danger it could be the Conference League. That sounds disrespectful, but you know what I mean. I think the Europa is such a step above the... The conference really. Uh, so no, I, th I think they can do it. I think they will do it. I think they will get sixth, uh, even though it still is a pretty competitive field there. And I fully expect a, a strong end of the season. Yeah, based on the fixtures left, sixth is absolutely achievable. Yeah, I think Europa Conference. Everyone would accept it as a that's still a decent season given mm. what we've been through and the injuries and everything else. Europa League, which is still not where we want to be. We want to be a Champions League club. Ultimately, you know, I'd imagine the hierarchy also has a long term ambition to be regularly in the Champions League. Um, but totally agree, totally agree. It's it's there for the taking now. Uh, we've got one of the nicest run-ins fixture-wise, mm. yeah. um, bar Arsenal, 
the rest of our games are very very winnable um so yeah totally agreed there for the taking and i would be i'll be over the moon honestly i feared the worst around february time when it just wasn't turning because like you say we had that conversation about well now that eddie howe's got kind of a week to prepare for most fixtures they're spaced out we've got time to kind of get the team ready prepare for each game it wasn't really happening it was slowly happening but it wasn't mm. happening quick enough we're now seeing that we're now seeing what happens when the team is ready for each game and there seems to be a game plan for everyone we play like you know yeah. it was quite different at fulham the week before to spurs at home totally different approaches six points on the board you'd expect to see the same again next week when the when the next two games come around so yeah it's been it's been nice to to reflect on what's actually going to be a good season hopefully part two of the show craig but a quick one from me first uh i forgot to mention in the first part we are doing a live show at aspers who sponsor this podcast on uh, a week on friday so friday before the sheffield united game myself alex charlotte uh, and special guests mark douglas norman riley and others uh, it's gonna be a more informal um kind of chat amongst us and interactive with the with the crowd so there are still tickets available um so get yourself involved uh, link in the description of this podcast right craig part two of the show um there's been a lot of chat about um, PSR, and I'm not going to get into the detail of it because we don't know what the rule change is going to be yet. But the implications for Newcastle, either if the rules stay the same or if they change, seems to be that we're going to have to offload some players. And there's mm. there's lots of talk in particular of of big sales being imminent for Newcastle. Bruno is the one they mentioned, maybe Isaac, but Bruno has been the name on the lips of lots of kind of chat about, well, Newcastle need to sell him or might have to sell mm. him, especially obviously as the release clause, but... I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on the likelihood of Bruno Gamarish mm. moving on in the summer. Um, does the player want to stay? Um, is anyone likely to pay the the mm. release clause? What, what what are your thoughts on, on the Bruno situation? I think with Bruno now, if Bruno was to go, it would be player-led rather than club-led. I think it would take Bruno to go to them and say that he wants to move on and his agent brings an offer to the table which meets the release clause or gets very close to it mm. and gives Newcastle a decision to make. That would probably come from abroad somewhere like PSG, potentially. Uh, now, in terms of a big name going, and of course, we sat down with Darren Neils in January, and it was my own question when I said, you know, does every player have their price? And he said, you know, yes, they do, and that mm. created headlines. At the time, it was a good question. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, on the back of that, there's since been a lot of talk about would a Bruno, a Botman, a Gamarish potentially go this summer now? Of course, that potential remains. I think in an FFP world, you are always open to to that possibility, especially given if it, say, for example, a hundred million, the, the, the release clause was met for Bruno, hundred million pounds, and the player indicator wanted to go. I think Newcastle, you know, well, they would have to do that because the release clause was met. But any figure approaching that could perhaps just make too much sense. As much as Eddie Howe wouldn't want to lose one of his best players, and I get, you know, the likes of Bruno are very hard to replace. Uh, I, I think that release clause at that value exists for a reason because I think mm. it would, you know, it, it would make too much sense, and it's just there as probably slightly above his actual value. But is it there to serve as to serve as temptation? But more practically, I'm talking in theory there. Do I think it'll happen this summer? No, I probably don't because I think what I'm hearing is there is a a raft, a band of players below that who they can perhaps trade with that would mean that would allow. Isaac, Gordon, Gamarish, you know, to keep those real. For me, what are the elite, top ticket, top mm. level players who would command upwards of, of £80 million each? I think there still is a little bit of juice in the squad around the likes of Wilson, Almiron, maybe one or two others, whereby you can get five, tens, fifteens, and that could then amount to somewhere close to £60, £70, £80 million, pound, which would be the equivalent of one of those. So that's what I expect to see happen this summer. Uh, Isaac is the one that, the way he's playing at the moment, he is the one they are vulnerable, perhaps, to, to offers for, I think. Uh, you know, there's no striker in current form in yeah. the Premier League doing what he is doing routinely. Mm -hmm. Now, at the live show back in August, I raised it, didn't I, that I said, you know, I had no doubt about Alexander Isaac ability-wise, but my concern would be, if you were to get a, con no, my thinking would be, if you were to get a big offer for him, the concern of him not playing enough matches would perhaps make that calculation worth considering. You know, if you can park ability and just look at... When I did the interview with Anthony Gordon six weeks ago, the best I'd never heard this quote before, and he said it to me uh, that day. He said, availability is the best ability. I just thought, wow. He said, you know, I don't know the physios. They don't, I don't know them personally. A lot of players have got really good relationships with the medical staff. He said, I never want to be that guy. And, you know, touch wood so far. Yeah, he hasn't been. Uh, you know... 
But Isaac, the Newcastle have played 32 games this year. Alexander Isaac has started 21 of them. He hasn't started 11 matches. That is still a third of games he's mm. missed because of fitness issues. Now, yes, he's in the midst of a brilliant run, but what he's doing at the moment for Newcastle over the course of his close to two years at the club is proving the exception rather than the rule. When it becomes the rule, that is when you're talking about this guy being, you know, up there with Haaland, you know, to go further back to be talked about in the same sort of bracket as Henri, Shearer, whoever you want to compare him to. But for now, this is a, a brilliant, uh, brilliant run. He's in form, he's fit, he's looking as sharp as he ever has done. It's got to continue. But to answer your question, it was with regards to you know, potential, potential suitors and teams coming in for him. If he finishes the season the way he does, uh, I think, yeah, there might be there might be interest and why wouldn't that be the way he is at the moment? Yeah, it's it's a funny one because Bruno is the one talked about more, but Isaac is the is the more difficult um, player to get in the market, mm. a, a striker who can score 20 goals in the Premier League yeah. for a team that struggled and, for, and whilst injured half the time, like yeah, you say, yeah. because I think with Isaac, you get two things. One is the 11 games he's missed, but he's always needs a couple of games to get match sharp mm. against it post-injury. He doesn't really hit his stride until three or four more games. So yeah, yeah. It makes his numbers even more spectacular, by the way, because yeah. they've come in a. If you if you take that into consideration, an even smaller number of games, and you'd probably say that yeah, his top performances are in in half the games he's played rather than those those uh, two thirds of the season. But um, yeah, Bruno is the one everyone's talking about. But Isaac, I, I totally agree. It would be the, the the bigger loss now. What the problem we have is, like you say, it's a difficult one because if you're going to spend ten games a season without a striker, that's that's a problem. So it's a problem they need to solve. And again, it, as we've just said. It's really hard to buy strikers that are Premier League quality. Mm. It's even harder to buy a striker that can be a number two, which is what we need. Um, I think Wilson's time is up, and I think you're right. Uh, if we're going to look at how to generate funds, whatever you can get for Wilson, whatever you can get for Miggy, <laughs> might even have to sell one of the homegrown lads in, mm. in Anderson or, or Longstaff um, to, to to get some feedback or Miley. You know, um, and I can see that being enough to to keep the other lads, which mm. I think is absolutely paramount. But I think of the three, Isaac Gordon, you could include Botman in this as well. Um, and Bruno Isaac is the one because you, you're just not going to replace that easily and mm. he's, he's an absolute hidden gem really because no, yeah. no one else wanted to take a punt on him maybe the fitness record is, a, is the situation but as long as you can get someone who can deputise for him and, and rotate him and keep him fresh mm. that's all we need you just don't need a Callum Wilson who might also be injured at the same time which yeah, has yeah. been the, the downfall this season for a while they, they worked interchangeably and it was perfect mm. but it's it's going to be rare they're going to be on the same his, his, trajectory his, like that. His fitness record at Real Sociedad, by the way, just to, to pick up on that point there, was perfect. It was good. Yeah. He played all the time. It's only since he came to Newcastle, and he wouldn't be the first player to experience this, that he's yeah. actually had problems. And it's uh, different intensity of football, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. And the you Premier know, League, Eddie Howe, Newcastle, yeah, United, yeah. the way we're playing. And that, that's what he's got to prove. He's got to prove that robustness. But in terms of actual ability, uh, wow, you know, and, and the word I'm getting back from inside Newcastle is he's the one they just do not want to sell. While I think if money came in for Bruno, there'd be a conversation to be had. I think they will definitely, to the best of their ability, reject all potential uh, overtures towards Alexander Isak because he's a player you build a team, you build a team around. You know, he is so hard to come by. You just couldn't replace him. Doesn't matter what you got. How lucky and how much money would Newcastle need to to, to have to go out and buy a player of that quality? It, it's close to impossible. Do you think? Uh, both Bruno and Isaac, and I suppose again Botman. Um, I, I don't think Gordon's got any any visions on leaving Newcastle at the minute. It's going no. really well for him. He's, he's fairly yeah. fresh, but you know the, the other three have been around a while. They were sold Champions League football. It's not going to be there next season. Do you think any of the three are considering or would be tempted by a move abroad? I mean, you look at Bruno. He does a lot of kind of kissing the badge and mm. pointing at Newcastle, and you've got his his missus tweeting and and doing social media mm. posts about Newcastle's their home. Um, you've got Joe Linton just signed a new deal, which I think might be a factor for Bruno. You know, yeah, his yeah. pal staying here. Do you think the, the there is a way to tempt them with with a bigger yeah. club? A hundred percent, yeah, absolutely. You know, we we can't sit here and talk about Alexander Isak being an elite international class Champions League level player and then say he's going to be happy playing in the Europa League or the Conference League for two seasons. Yeah. You know, those two things don't tally. I think you can afford one season out of the Champions League. I don't think you can afford two. I think if Alexander Isak stays this year and replicates his form next season, but Newcastle don't finish in the top four, I think then, you know, the likelihood is that Isak will move on. The club has got to maintain pace and mm. to, 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 to satisfy these players, to satisfy that ambition. You know, Bruno Gamarage is someone who has never hidden his ambition. He doesn't need it. We've just got to look at how he handles himself, how he conducts himself. He's a, 
you know, he's, he, he's a Brazil starting international three or four weeks ago for, for it, it Wembley there. You know, he is a, he wants to be playing Champions League. Like I say, I think they can afford one year out of it. Beyond that, I think the names we've just mentioned, even Gordon as well, you know, Gordon by that point, if he's an established England international, which I think he will go on to, to be the forms he, he's in at the moment. So don't underestimate how important it is for Newcastle to get back in the Champions League next year. A, to continue to attract that calibre of player, but B, perhaps more importantly, to keep the elite ones they've already got. Yeah, it's a funny one because if we don't, do they still have the value they have now as, as they're all in, in kind of great form? You assume if we don't make it to the top four in a year's time, something's gone wrong again or mm. things haven't quite pulled together. Maybe maybe we're still in the shout, I don't know. But um, yeah, it's an interesting one and, and one I don't like to think about too much, but I totally stand by what we've just said, that Isaac probably for me is probably the most important. That said, yeah. Bruno is very hard to replace as well. Mm. Uh, they're both so so crucial and, you know, Botman this season probably isn't isn't what, what you'd say, but yeah. Botman we had last year is absolutely another one of those players. Yeah. Um, so that the spine of the team, as far as I'm concerned, you do exactly what you said. You find other ways to... To, to generate that income yeah. and if, it, if that means selling one of the homegrown lads as much as I hate to say it if that gets you out of a PSR loophole for for the time being and allows mm. you to spend a bit more money where it's needed then that's what we have to do to, to keep these lads at the club and I think the only way we're going to chase that top four is to make some improvements because I think this season has proven that whilst we've got a great 11 on our day um, we haven't got a good enough squad to, to manage no. on, on European football mm. and actually some of those players with injuries and, and the way we want to play we're just not going to get we're not going to get last season out of them ever again, really. You think about the other ones like Cher, like Byrne, another year older. Um, mm. Goalkeeper, Nick Pope out for half a season. Yeah, so yeah. we need to look at the goalkeeper situation. Callum Wilson, is he going to be moved on? You know, there's a lot to do um, to <laughs> to achieve that ambition, like you say, of, of getting back into the Champions League to keep those players at the club and to keep the club going the right direction. It's not fucking easy, is it? It's really, really <laughs> fucking hard. Yeah. <sighs> and it, it, it's, where they, it's where they fell down last summer, really, in terms of the recruitment. We won't go into it again because you and I have spoken about it so many times but the recruitment last summer I don't think aided them enough in the isolation of the season in, in front of them uh, this summer has to and there's one or two free transfer options out there Lloyd Kelly absolutely is being pursued I wrote in my uh, NUFC notebook column for the Daily Mail last week that I think the the agent fee there at the moment some of the fees involve a little bit of a stumbling block but I think Kelly makes a lot of sense you would like to see progress in that regard and there's one or two other. they're gonna to have to be clever they're gonna to have to be creative because the injuries to the two center halves have given them a real problem now mm. that i'm told is sort of if has really changed the thinking it, it doesn't take inside information for that to be yeah. uh, for that to be air that's stating the obvious but you know that has really <clears throat> changed how, they, how they're looking at things and uh yeah it, it just needs the, the the bench now would the bench is run is as would it have ran as cold and as shallow as it has done, if not for the injuries, you know, probably not. But you still, you still got a fact that there's still going to be injuries next year. You know, mm -hmm. I still do think the need in so the, the squad runs out at about sort of 19, 20 players. Still, they're still from sort of twenty one down to twenty five who want what you would call real first team players. And you know, without going into into names too much, but uh, yeah, the, the the need greater depth. Now, how, how do you achieve greater depth? It's that do you do you buy do you buy First team players, big ticket players, do you go for two or three of those and then the depth filters down because first team starters drop out? Or do you do you build from the build from the bottom? They tried to build from the bottom last year for me too much by bringing in Livermento, by bringing in Hall, who are clearly players for tomorrow, not for today, as good as Livermento is. Even Tonali wasn't really a player for, for the now. You know, mm. the ban aside, he came in and clearly needed time to adapt. And Barnes was a player that signed in the position of the one man Gordon, who for me was clearly going to be one of the best players this year. So even though I've just said we won't revisit everything we've spoken about previously <laughs> with regards to last summer's recruitment, I hope I've, uh, I've given you a shorter version of it there. So no, big summer for them recruitment wise. Uh, and for now, from what I'm hearing is that the absolute focus is, is trying to solve that problem with centre half. Yeah, I suppose um, Saturday's performance against Spurs was evidence that you can use Gordon on the other side. And he looked get, better. Get Do you know what, Sai? Yeah. Si? There was something about him. It almost, I watched him for England and we've all watched him a lot play on the left. On the left, he, he, he checks in a lot. And yes, he can do a lot of damage when he checks in, but it was really refreshing on Saturday to see him just run in straight lines and use his pace in mm. straight lines, like quite old fashioned, you know, how to see a right footer on the right. And it really, that, that was a, one of the biggest positives from the game on Saturday because it was almost like discovering 
a new player in a new position, really. I thought he, I thought he was arguably better on yeah. the right. I mean, he still found himself drifting towards the left and he scored his goal from the left. But yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. that's from him cutting inside and that's his, that's just what his skill set is. He can go in any direction and he will keep the ball and, mm. and win it back. But yeah, um, I'm sure we'll see more of Harvey Barnes when, when he's past this injury, which he seems to be now. Like that was the mm. first time he's played like 88 or 89 minutes. Like that's, mm. that's really good. And I thought he was, he was much better than he has been in the starting lineup before when he just hasn't looked quite at it. And that, yeah. that's... That's encouraging because, yeah, of all the signings last summer, he was meant to be the one that at least improves the first team, like you say. Um, yeah. Tonali maybe an experiment and and kind of a, a player to bring through. But Barnes and maybe Livermento were meant to be used a lot more. Um, I still can't quite get my head around how long it took us to get Livermento in the team because he's a, he's a great player. Yeah. And we're starting to see why Lewis Hall perhaps should have been used a bit more bit more earlier on in the season that said he keeps getting or, cramped or, after 80 minutes yeah or, or you're seeing what Lewis Hall should have done himself earlier in the season mm-hmm. I think that would be that would be the response from from the coach and staff yeah, yeah it would be you know it wasn't that we weren't playing him it was that he wasn't showing what he's shown in recent weeks and you've got to look at Livermento and there was a reason there was that game down at Wolves wasn't there when they were struggling there was injured players on the pitch and Hall and Livermento were both subs unused that day and you thought Wow, what are they showing, or what are they rather, what are they not showing behind the scenes to have come in as a £70 million pair, to not even get a sniff mm. when it's crying out for them to be brought on? And uh, yeah, but, but of all the signings last summer, Barnes was the one, even though I looked at it and thought there was greater need for a player on the right, Barnes made a lot of sense in that the Premier League numbers were there. The Premier League numbers weren't there with the other three, and that was the the, the point I made. You know, I could see the sense of Harvey Barnes. So I just thought that the the needed players to come in who were ready made to hit the ground running, as quite incredibly, pretty much every other sign and had done previously. Whereas they brought in three who needed a period of adaptation for different reasons, and the other one Barnes got injured really quickly. So last summer's recruitment was a disaster. That's not to say it'll be classed as a disaster in a year's time. Yeah. Well, if it wasn't fit for last season and it was fit for the future, next season is the future from that yeah, point yeah. of view. So yeah, totally agree. Part three then, Craig, we'll, uh, we'll quickly wrap up on kind of where the, the squad is now for these remaining six games. Um, we've seen news break that Willick's definitely out for the rest of the season. Where do you so, see that break? Um, <laughs> go on, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I wanted to get your thoughts on, obviously. Yeah. Um, is this... Uh, we're also seeing the likes of Trippier, who was meant to be back and he's, he's not, and, and some of the other injuries mm. that we thought were would imminently back uh, Nick Pope as well being extended and and kind mm. of delayed is that is this a change of approach from the club based on the fact that we've seen we've rushed a few players back this season and it's it's not ended well are they being more cautious is the decision mm. about Willick exactly that let's get him properly fit and get him properly sorted I think so yeah uh, in theory Joe Willick you went to see a specialist last week I think it was in theory Joe Willick could play you know he is the, the specialist has said your Achilles is okay it is healed. There's just a lingering pain that probably mm. needs a greater period of rest. And I think Newcastle have looked at it and thought, if Joe Willick was playing and performing well with pain, they might say, well, you know, it's, it, it's worth it. But the pain was clearly having an impact on his performance. So it's twofold this. One, you had a player who was not playing well enough to justify selection. I thought mm. his level had come so far off how good he really is that he probably wouldn't have been in the team anyway, that Anderson, Gamaraj and Longstaff would have been in ahead of him. And then you look at it and I think they've just thought, you know, to, 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 to have him back in best shape ahead of pre-season, what would be like a new player based on this year, because he hasn't featured at all really, uh, an extended period of rest coupled with some really specific strength and conditioning work around the Achilles area, around the leg area. They've decided that's the best course of action. And honestly, I, I think for once, with regards to Newcastle and fitness and decisions, uh, it's, the, it's the right call yeah. they've made, absolutely. Uh, is it a gamble based on the fact we've got Longstaff, as we keep hearing, playing through all sorts of pain and injuries? Um, Anderson's back from a long time out, and yes, he's he's looked brilliant, and I'm mm. glad he's back. Is that is it a gamble, or is it is it because Anderson's excelled and looks absolutely fine to finish the yeah. season? Is is that why they've been able to do this with Willick? I, th- I think Anderson's been a massive boost in that yeah. regard, and I've, I've always I love Elliot Anderson. You come in against you know the game against Everton, and I give him on my. YouTube channel, you know, people enjoy the three, two, one merit stars. I give them three stars that night. <laughs> and a few people come back at me and when well, they didn't say he played badly, they thought he played well. They were querying the three. And I just thought, no, to, to in the context of it, for him to come into that team and I just thought he showed us that day what a difference he makes to that midfield. Something yeah. different, that that bravery on the ball, that he's just a he's like action man at times. He's got that that robust build. He's like a Royal Marine. You can see him being special forces. He's he's such a, you know, in I've watched him over the years. He wasn't anything like that. He was a skinny little lad who was skillful on the ball. 
Now he's married all that together. I just love him. I think he's so good. I really, really do. I thought he's brilliant again on Saturday. So yes, to answer your question, Anderson has been a huge boost, which has probably allowed Willock uh, potentially that period of rest. Joe Linton, they expect that perhaps feature in the last two or three games, you know, if not more. So there's a there's another boost. Gamores just doesn't get injured, doesn't get booked. He plays every week. And Longstaff, while he's playing through a little bit of a niggle, I think, you know, he's going week on week and his performance on Saturday was uh, was better. So, yeah, I think all of those factors combined is why we've seen Joe be given the rest of the, the season off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Anderson off the bench at Fulham changed the game as well because it, it wasn't it was not going well. Um, and, yeah, I suppose Longstaff's t- turned a corner, uh, to use that phrase again, in the last couple of games, he's looked a lot more himself in terms of mm. confidence. I think he was another one suffering really with confidence. But, yeah. Um, yeah, Ali Anderson is, is the complete player, isn't he? We've kind of gone through this period where Bruno Gamaris was on the, the nine yellows and couldn't p- commit a tackle. Longstaff doesn't really commit tackles. Lewis Miley didn't really get stuck in yeah. and get tackles. He was, you know, far too lightweight, and that's not his fault for being 17 and, yeah. and not having gone through exactly what you've described in Anderson, which is this kind of bulking up and, and really be developing physically because he does look like an absolute different mm. proposition. So he's, he's, he's got all the missing facets that those other players have. So Longstaff gives you all the legs. He runs around and, and covers ground and does does the donkey work in midfield. Bruno is... is the only one been moving the ball around for the last six weeks. But like you say, Anson mm. has got a pass in him. He's got some skill in him. He can drive us forward, which we've been missing so much. Like Longstaff and Miley, tidy, give them the ball. They'll pop it off to a defender, keep the ball, but they won't try many things and won't take mm. many risks. Anderson's happy to take risks. He's yeah, happy yeah. and he's, he's successful in yeah. those risks. And yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a joy to watch. So totally get it. But when you've got Willock kind of struggling for form, playing with pain, why not just just let him go? Yeah, I just yeah. I just wasn't sure if there's a bit of a gamble there. And yeah, I suppose when you bring into the others on like Trip Year and Pope still don't seem yeah. to be back. We don't know when they're going to be back. The news on these players is mm. less drip fed than it even was before. At other club just nothing right. We've just got to get to the end of the season and not take any more risk because I suppose you've got Tonali's missing the start of the season, obviously with his ban. Joe Linton's injury goes into next season, potentially. Botman's injury goes into next season. We can't have any more players who won't be fit at the start of the next season, surely. Yeah, I think that's the... Well, they know they're going to be without Botman themselves at the start of next year. Uh, like I said, Joe Linton, I think, will be back before the end of this season, which if he gets one or two games mm. under his belt, that's a big boost ahead of ahead of pre-season. Uh, the thing is with Willick, it just touched on the answer I said before, it's less of a gamble because he wasn't playing well. Yeah. If you're taking a player who's playing well at the team and saying, actually, it's for the best if you just don't play now. He wasn't playing well enough to justify being there. And that's not a criticism. It was because of the problem he had. So it's no for me. In the end, I think it's a bit of a no-brainer. Yeah. Spot on. All right, Craig, things are looking up. It's been uh-huh. a, a, probably the most positive chat we've had in, in months. Um, great to have you in. As I, I said before, um, we're on Patreon for as little as £3 a month where we talk to Craig regularly, as well as others. Um, come join us. And um, I'll mention the live show one more time. Next Friday, which is the 16th, no, 26th of uh, of April, uh, at Aspers, who sponsor this podcast, which you'll have heard at the start and the end. Um, come join us. It'll be a good laugh. Thanks very much for listening. Cheers, Craig. This podcast is brought to you by Aspers Casino Newcastle, home of the £4 pint on match day. That's all Newcastle home games and any televised Newcastle fixture. The offer applies from midday until midnight on all draft beers. Be gamble aware, over 18s only. Visit BeGambleAware.org, uh, be drink aware, and for details and T's and C's, visit AspersNewcastle.co.uk.